Hello, my name is Carol McCoy. Today is December the 13th, 2021. We are located at the Nashville Bar Association offices at One Nashville Place, Nashville, Tennessee. This interview is being conducted for the Legal History Project of the Nashville Bar Association, and I have the pleasure of interviewing Susan Short Jones. Hello. Hello. Would you please state your full name? Susan Short Jones. And the date and place of your birth. You want the year also? Yes. <laughs> 128, 1953, Dallas, Texas. Please tell me a little about your grandparents. Let's start um, maternal. All right. All right. Um, my grandparents were from East Texas um, and moved to Dallas, um, I guess in the 40s or so. Um, my grandfather uh, was a porter at um, the Majestic Theater, and my grandmother was a stay-at-home mom. And on your father's side? On my father's side, um, my grandmother and grandfather were from Virginia. I moved to Pittsburgh um, probably in the 20s, um, and my grandfather worked in the steel mill, and my grandmother was a stay-at-home mom. And their names were? Waverly and Susie Short. And your maternal grandparents' names were? Mary, Mary and Robert Beecham. <clears throat> and let's move into your parents, mm -hmm. their names, places, mm -hmm. and dates of birth, and then we'll talk a little bit about what they did. Okay. So my father's name is Stanley James Short. Was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, when? Nineteen twenty-one. October sixth. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and then um, my mother is Margaret Short, and she was born in Dallas. I want, no, she was not born in Dallas. I think she was born in Terrell, Texas. She was born before she moved before the family moved to Dallas, and. Her date of birth is 1927. October 15th. October 15th. <clears throat> Would you tell us a little bit about what your parents did, their business that they were in, political and community activities, and the interests that they had? So we'll start with my dad. Um, my dad was a postal worker and mechanical genius. Um, but he, his formal employment was with the U.S. Postal Service. Um, but he also started his own business as an auto mechanic. And from autos went to boats and just did a number of things. Just, you know, an all-around guy that could do anything and everything. Now, I think you told me he wasn't political, but he had a big interest in sports. Oh, well, you know, you're from Dallas, you have an interest in sports, but not a, not a political, not political in that sense, no. And what were some of his favorite hobbies? Uh, Daddy was a hunter and a ship and a um, fisherman, and he just enjoyed all things outdoors. Like? Well, um, he had horses, so he enjoyed riding horses and would often ride in the city parades with his little show horses. Um, but he also liked to just hunt. So we had coon dogs and those things, and they'd run. I don't know much about hunting, but they would, um, you know, they'd hunt dove and rabbit. And did you learn to ride? Things. No, okay. I, I did not learn to ride. And then your mother, mm -hmm. um, what did she do as far as if she worked or had any involvement in the community or the politics or her my, interests? Most of my mother's involvement was around her children, so she was very much involved in, in the PTA. Uh, she was a seamstress and um, a very good seamstress, worked with a um, design factory um, for designer clothes. Um, in New York? In Dallas. Dallas. In okay. Dallas and um, then later started her own business and um, 
made clothes for Neiman Marcus and places like that, um, and also helped to make clothes for the Dallas Cowboys, their little jackets and whatnot. So. And one of her interests, um, besides her family, was church? Yes, my mother is very much involved in church. Um, and she's still with you? Yes, she is. And your father, too? No, dad passed about three years ago. I'm sorry. <clears throat> and brothers and sisters? Yes, so there were five of us. My mother's son, David Sockwell, is my half-brother. He's deceased. Mm -hmm. um, I'm next in line. And then I have a sister, Marilyn, that's about a year younger than I. Then we had another brother, uh, Stanley Jr., um, who was a police officer, and he passed many years ago. I can't recall now. And then we had a baby brother <laughs> after that, Patrick, and he's still with us. And what does he do? Uh, Patrick is, it took a lot after my father. So he has all these mechanical skills, but he's a ta he does tax prep and you know, just kind of, he was working for a community college as an administrator and admissions assistant. So, you know, just a little bit of everything. What was your childhood like? Where did you grow up? Who were some of your childhood friends? So I grew up in Dallas. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we may have moved a couple of times before we settled in a place where we stayed from the time that I was in the first grade, I guess. And, um, you know, life was good. Where did life you go to school? Good. First grade. Um, elementary school mm -hmm. was Albert Sidney Johnston. Um, junior high was Oliver Wendell Holmes. And high school was Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And I think when we were talking earlier, you said that it was a totally segregated school system? Well, we, we had um, what we referred to as our minority population, and those were our Mexican friends. We had, I think, maybe like 3% Mexican population in my high school. But otherwise, my um, experience was in a totally segregated environment. And do you recall some of your school friends, uh, what you all did for recreation, any travel that you took while you were in elementary or junior high or high school? Well, travel uh, was with family. So, you know, we would travel to Pennsylvania, we'd go up to Mammoth Cave in Missouri, so we would, you know, and my dad loved to fish, of course, so we would regularly wake up about 3 a.m. in the morning and go to the lake and <laughs> And fish and mom would cook outside so it was like a big camping trip so that was fun but my friends are you know fortunately they're still with us so you know my close friends uh, Sandra and Lynn and Vivian and those are and Cheryl those are all folks that I grew up with and we just did and you're still stuff. friends today we're still friends today we had across from my house was a a park and a that had a swimming pool, so we'd hang out at the park and go swimming and, you know. You had some favorite teachers in elementary and in high school. Yes. Do you remember them? Well, there was Miss Hickman, which was my first grade teacher. Miss Barrett, that was my third grade teacher. Um, and I can't, I'm gonna blank on her last name. I think it was Stratford, which is my fifth grade teacher. She was English teacher? She was, yes, she was English. So, you know, we had great teachers. Um, and in high school, I had Miss Lewis, who was my math calculus trigonometry teacher, and um, Mr. Brown, my physics teacher, and, you know, just really a, just a wonderful group of teachers, very supportive. <clears throat> when you finished high school, where did you apply to go to college? I applied to several places, mostly on the East Coast. So I applied to Wellesley and Smith and Denison University and ended, ended up at Denison in Granville, Ohio. <clears throat> what, how did you decide on Denison? Well, 
I had a friend who had a cousin <laughs> who was familiar with the school. I, when I applied, I had never been there. And when I got accepted, it was my first time going there. So um, it, it just seemed like a perfect size, and I had great financial aid. Now that helps. Yes. Yeah. So you decide to go there, mm -hmm. and what did you find um, as far as the school environment and the classes that you took? So um, I was from Dallas, and Granville, Ohio, um, and our school sat on what I all often thought was a glacier plain because it was awfully cold, <laughs> and for the first time I saw real snow, so it was a it was a change. Of course, I had come from a predominantly black school, and this was a majority white school. So there was a significant difference in terms of that experience. Um, and there were, I think in my class, there may have been 14 black students. And how would you characterize that experience, uh, moving you know, into a predominantly white school? Yeah, you know, it was. The school was a liberal arts school, so you had a lot of people who were very open and supportive. You also had um, students there that had never interacted with black students, so they really didn't have, you know, a sense of what that meant. Um, so, it, in in many respects, it, it ended up being very segregated because people just went with what they knew, right? And so. Um, but it was, I mean, overall, I think it was a great experience. How did you develop your study habits and what friends did you incorporate into your everyday life at college? Yeah. Well, of course, my, my close friends were, you know, the women that I met after, after coming to, to Denison uh, that are still friends today. Um, and the study habits, I guess I'd always had pretty good study, study habits. I was a, a studious person, loved to read. And so I took instruction well. So, you know, it was very, it was a very structured environment. I mean, if you had 32 books to read for the semester, you knew you needed to pace yourself and, and make that happen. And so it was not, it was not, I think it was different in terms of study habits for undergrad than it was for law school. How did you decide on a major? Well, I had always wanted to practice law. That was my plan, was to go to college. When did you know that was your plan? Well, I was probably eight or 10 years old. And can you point to any event or uh, occurrence that kind of exposed you to the law or being a lawyer? I think it was TV. You know, um, Perry Mason was big back then, and my aunt was a great Perry Mason fan, and um, she was a nurse, and you know she would often share her dream for me, and it was to be a U.S. senator or to be a lawyer, and so I thought the lawyer was something that <laughs> I might be able to relate to a little bit more, and you know it it did suit me in terms of my my personality. So when you got to college, what did you decide to major in, given Political that Political science. Political science. Yes. And what were those courses like in the classes? You know, just, I'm, like I said, I, I enjoy learning, always have. And so it was, you know, it was a wonderful opportunity to kind of delve into political science and all of those social science aspects of that, that are related to that degree, the economics and the philosophy and all those things. So. Did you have any extracurricular activities, any things that you participated while you were on campus? Not so much, not so much. Um, I, there were activities that were associated with my major, so I was involved in the community and you know, worked on programs. I, I was pursuing a second major in urban sociology, and so we had activities in the community just studying um, different aspects of how people were living, what public housing meant, how, you know, what the consequences of that were, interviewing people that were there, that kind of thing. Now, during the summers, what did you do uh, for summer work experience while you were in college? 
You know, that's hard for me to recall. I, I remember that I did some work, and I, I guess part of my work may have been to come back home, and I worked in um, with a construction company. Uh, one of my former principals had a construction company, so I worked there as an administrative assistant. So, you know, just little odds and ends. I think you mentioned that before college you had actually worked part-time for an insurance company? Yes, yes. And also with your mother? Yes, yes, yes. Um, what classes did you enjoy uh, while you were in college? Hmm. I enjoyed philosophy. Um, I enjoyed economics. Um, just learning all of the ins and outs of that. And I enjoyed my political science courses. I had a great poli-sci chair of the department and just, you know, it was just interesting to learn all of that. I also loved the English um, literature courses that we took because we had an opportunity to study different cultures through literature. Did you do any work study programs? Yes, it was all work study programs. So yeah, I did a lot of work at the library, mostly you know, just assisting with that. Oh, right. And, um, do you still stay in touch with some of the friends you said you do, I do. that you made there? Where are they? Oh, I have friends in, in D.C. I have friends in New Jersey, friends in Pennsylvania, friends in Chicago. Um, we're, we're scattered, um, but mostly around the East Coast. Now, <clears throat> I don't think you had any military experience during any of this, no. but things were happening in our society. Mm -hmm. um, did any of the events that were occurring, and this is probably in the middle to late 60s? 70s. 70s, early 70s? Mm -hmm. Did any of those ex uh, events, whether it was Watergate or anything like that, have any impact on you at the college or um, cause you to reflect in any way about what was happening in the society? I think less so Watergate, more, more so the Black Power Movement. And, um, and what was happening at that time? Well, you know, it was just a time, I think um, Kent State had occurred before right. I went to college, but there were a number of students still at Denison that were very familiar with that and were, you know. Still traumatized? <laughs> yes by all of that, but you know, as a result of that, we, we began to um, pursue more activities on campus that were relevant to the black students to make them a part of the community. And so. what, if any of those activities, did you feel like you participated in, whether they were community or social service or yeah. something? Well, we had a black student union, and so you know, we were involved in supporting the community just in general. So, you know, if it was tutoring or things of that nature. Now, you've already revealed to me that you were interested in law school, so I have a hint that next question about what did you do when you graduated from uh, college yes. is gonna be rather evident. What did you do when you graduated from college? Well, um, of course I had applied to law school, mm -hmm. right? So it was a direct move from college to law school. And I had the opportunity to participate in a program that was called CLEO. And it was a, a program to uh, prepare you for law school. And so uh, it was, I want to say a six month program in Houston. So we, would, we went down and they kind of simulated the law school environment and there were students from all over the country that came there. It sounds very interesting. It was, it was. And did you live in a dorm during that time? Yes. And did you meet anyone that uh, became a, a factor in your life as far as where you went to law school? Or No, because at that point, I mean, these were all students from everywhere, and of course we connected during that six-month period, but I could not name a person that I maintained a relationship with from that. Um, what were the schools, if you remember, that you applied to, and 
which ones were you interested in and which one did you go to? So I was interested in going to schools with a national, that national law schools. Uh, my professors had educated me along those lines. So applied to several schools all across the country and, you know, East Coast, West Coast, uh, in the South. Um, I remember Emory was on my list. And I was fortunate enough to be accepted at many of them. Um, but then ultimately decided on Vanderbilt because it was, um, kind of between home and the relationships that I had built with friends. And when you decided on Vanderbilt, did you come and take a tour of the school before you came? Uh, how did you get acquainted with it? Yeah, I really didn't. I, uh, I applied. Um, at the time, um, my college, one of my college buddies was Richard Dinkins, now Judge Dinkins. One of your college buddies? Yes. So he went to Denison too? Yes, he went to Denison. Okay. And um, so he told me a little bit about Vanderbilt as I applied and that it was really nice because as once I was accepted, I had someone I knew <laughs> that was already here to kind of help me uh, navigate. And what was your experience that first year in law school? I think that it was probably as traumatic as most people experienced the first year. It was uh, very different. Um, my undergraduate experience was in a very liberal culture, which was just the opposite of law school, which was a very conservative Southern culture. And so that adjustment was a, a bit of a challenge. And what was the makeup of your class, both Again, I women think, and men and yeah. blacks and white? Yeah. Well, obviously, majority white male. And um, those, the women were beginning to take more of a presence uh, in the class. I want to say maybe a third of the class were women. And this was what year when you started? This was in 75. 75, OK. And, um, but again, I think there were probably about 14 black students in my class, so. And were you uh, a relatively close-knit group in yes. law school? Yes, yes. Uh, do you remember any of your favorite professors in law school? You know, I had, I had, favorite, I, I had favorite professors. I had challenging professors. Um, one of my favorite, of course, was, was Bob Belton, who um, I, I guess I got to Bob in the second year, uh, but he was not a part of that first year of activities. Uh, Professor Bingham made an impression on me. Um, so he was um, civil procedure and was very different than um, most professors that I had encountered. I think Bingham. that's why they called him Weird Harold Bingham. <laughs> he yes. was different. Yes. And then there was Terry Calvani, who was a fairly new professor then to contracts. And he was just an interesting personality, but very good at what he did. Um, I remember the dean, I think um, was Dean Knaus, when I was there, which was, you know, he was just a very um, welcoming person and you know, just made you feel at ease and, you know, it was, that part of the experience was very positive. What were some of the courses that you found most interesting or that you liked? Hmm. Well, I, I found constitutional law very challenging, just trying to stitch together um, the meaning of all the decisions. I couldn't really make it fit and came to understand they didn't. So it was a challenge for me. Because they're disparate. That's right, that's right. And, um, but I enjoyed, I enjoyed contracts. You know, I enjoyed uh, corporations. I enjoyed, you know, just understanding, you know, the ins and outs of of business, not really realizing that that was really what law school was all about. Um, I was not much for criminal law. You know, it wasn't an interest of mine. Did you feel that you were embraced or accepted at Vanderbilt? By some, but not by others. And did you like law school? I know you said not yeah. About as much as everybody else likes law school. Right, right. I mean, I, you know, I 
tell uh, students now that are interested in law school is that I didn't go there to like it. I went there to pass the bar exam. And so um, I enjoyed the relationships that I had there. Um, and I value the school because I think they do a very good job in training you to be a lawyer. Very good. Um, I, that is one of the things about your assessment of the value of the law school curriculum. Mm -hmm. um, and at this point in your life, do you feel that you can evaluate the, the curriculum and what value it played for you? Through your career, you know, as you know, I really, I really see law school as really. Um, it really perpetuates the commercial aspect of law, at least at Vanderbilt, and I suspect at most of the larger law schools, national law schools, that that's really a focus. But Vanderbilt has been unique, I, from what I try to keep up with in terms of expanding uh, its curriculum to include international law, to include. Um, social justice types of training, um, which then, I guess back then, social justice was labor law and uh, civil rights. But <laughs> it has gotten a lot more involved since then. Uh, you mentioned Richard Dinkins as a friend that you had when you arrived. He was ahead of you. Yes. By yes. one He's year? He's older than I am. <laughs> All right. I hope Richard will remember that he's older. Um, was he a year or two? Just a year. year? Yes. Do you recall any other friends that you made in law school that are still friends today and lawyers somewhere in the United oh. States? Oh, yes. yes. And who would that be? I mean, Billy Sanders was here in Nashville. Mm -hmm. Billy Sanders here. Uh, Nancy Pugh, who is deceased. Um, and Debbie, she was a lawyer here in she town. She was a lawyer here. Um, Debbie Biggers and I were very close. She's now a judge in Alabama. Okay. Um, and you get to see them when you have reunions. Yes, when I can, yes. And uh, just a number of the classmates, I think Virtus Hicks ended up being uh, a director of law for Atlanta. She may be retired. She may be one of the smart ones who has since retired. But yes, I mean, just knowing, you know, the people that you interacted with are still around. Cliff Hardwick, I don't know if you remember Cliff, I uh, was in Atlanta. Um, while you were in law school, did you have to work and did you participate in any kind of law school activities? So, yes, I did work. Um, I, I worked and did an internship with legal services um, in law school. So I was a part of the, the legal clinic, I think, maybe in first year and the next Two years, I think I was working at legal services in the summer. Um, when you got to the end of law school, before we go on to the decisions that you made, I want to ask you a little bit about your family at that time. Mm -hmm. Now, you have gone to college, law school. Had you married it by that time? I married after law school. After law school. Have you any children? No children. And are there any other lawyers or possible lawyers in your family somewhere? <laughs> I'm trying to think if I've influenced anybody to be in the family to be a lawyer. Nieces uh, and nephews? <laughs> no, no. They're, you know, they are MBAs, and, but not lawyers. I think maybe... I demonstrated too much stress, I don't know. <laughs> because we've talked, I, I think I know part of the answer to this question, but would you recommend the law as a career to any of your relatives if you had that opportunity? Of course, of course. But I, because, you know, I think that it opens up a lot of options for you. Well, let's talk about some of the options that were opened up for you. Okay. Your early career as a lawyer. Tell us a little bit about the bar exam mm -hmm. and your job search as you come to the end of law school. What did you do with regards to preparing for the bar exam? So the bar exam was, you know, it was the take the review course without really understanding what that meant or, or other assistance that might be available. So I did the standard, was it Nord? 
um, the bar exam course. And I'm trying to think Nord or Kaplan, but I know they had bar exam courses. So I did that not really knowing what to do and just tried to exercise my good judgment in terms of how I should study. My judgment wasn't that good the first time I took the bar, so I took it a second time and I was a little more focused. And did gave, you have a study group? No study group. Did you know about study groups? No. <laughs> and I think there was one thing that I omitted, but you spent a little time in New York City while yes. you were in college. I did. And that becomes a little bit more important later in your career. Tell me a little bit about what you did in New York City. Sure. So at Denison, we had what's called a January term. It's a J term. And it's the opportunity for you to um, explore other experiences that you might have an interest in. And my interest in law took me to the National Urban League. So my J term was to be an intern at the Urban League with um, Vernon Jordan and the general counsel there. So for a month in January, we would go from um, New Jersey to New York every day. And you got to see how a lawyer was working yes. in, a, in an environment yes. at that point. So when you began your job search, you're taking the bar exam and you're considering what you're going to do, you had worked as a student at Legal Services. Mm -hmm. What um, areas did you consider in a job search? So I did what, the, uh, what I understood the other students to be doing. I interviewed with law firms um, that would come to Vanderbilt um, about opportunities there. But remember, this was in, at that point, the near to late 70s. And it was still very unique to have African-American lawyers in law firms. Um, so that was very was made very clear to me by some of the recruiters. And what did they, when you say made very clear to you, what did they say or imply? Oh, it was very clear that, um, that they did not think their law firm was prepared to have an African-American in their firm. I think that's pretty direct. Yes, it was. So how did you continue your job search? So I don't know that I did another interview after that. <laughs> Puts a damper on things. <laughs> yes. I, I just, I don't think that I explored that anymore because I figured, okay, because that firm was in Dallas. So that was one of the reasons that, you know, I took that on. Um, but I was with Legal Services and fortunately had the opportunity to go and work with them right after law school. And I think that was when they were in the downtown Parkway Towers. Parkway Towers, yes. And you had mentioned that Dot Dobbins mm -hmm. and Margaret Bim, mm -hmm. uh, Gordon Bonnyman was still there. Russ and, Overby. And yes. Dave Kozlowski. Yes. And yes. Ashley Wilcher was the executive director. Mm -hmm. director. But you had already had a relationship with all of them. Mm -hmm. What was the working environment like there? You know, it was so collegial. And they were very supportive. And of course, there was more than enough work to do, which meant that there was a great opportunity for learning. So it was, it was a wonderful, wonderful environment to, to work and learn. Um, during that time, the women's movement was also occurring. You had talked about the Black Panthers. Mm -hmm. Did you have any exposure to the women's movement, either in law school or as you got out? You know, the I, I would say my, my most significant experience, I worked in family law at Legal Services. Um, that was the, the section of Legal Services that, that I chose to work in along with Dot and Margaret. And we, you know, were very involved at that point with uh, domestic abuse, domestic violence. So, um, you know, had the opportunity to engage with the YWCA, which has always been an advocate for women and, you know, addressing domestic violence issues. We worked on a handbook to support women. Um, so, yes, women, women's issues All right. were front and center. Um, 
during that time, uh, did you participate in any events? Did you um, meet anyone during that time? So um, the Napier Ruby Bars Bar Association was being revived around that time. So I had the opportunity to um, work with Robert Lillard, who, who was a former council member and really a significant part in the formation of the Metropolitan Government. Um, and was really a, a great advocate of women. And so I became very involved in the Napier Ruby Bar Association and um, all the activities that were going on there. Did you serve on their board? Or? I served on the board. I served as president. I, what year were uh, you president, do you recall? Oh, geez. I won't remember exactly, but I want to say it was in the early 80s. Okay. So you'd been out of law school four or five years? Mm -hmm. You graduated in 78? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then started participating in not only legal services activities, mm -hmm. but also with the Napier mm -hmm. Luby Bar. Mm -hmm. um, did you ever participate in any political functions? Um, political functions in terms of legislative caucus, those kinds of things, yes, ultimately I was, I was involved with that because of my work largely with the, the State Board of Regents. Um, well, that's getting a little ahead of us because okay. what I'm hoping to do is to ask you, how did you meet Roland Jones? And that was that was a part of the when did when did we first meet? It was a part of the legislative caucus. Yeah. And what year was that about? Um, eighty six. Okay, I may be getting ahead of myself then. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just so that we have it on the record. That's your husband, yes, correct? Yes. Okay, because that's also important <laughs> at some point in this interview. Um, when you started working for legal services, mm -hmm. you'd been doing it as an intern. Mm -hmm. Do you recall what your starting salary was? Oh my goodness. It was, I think it was like $1,000 a month. And I think that, actually I think we got a raise and it was, it became 15000 a year. So a little bit more. Yes. yes. <clears throat> Do you have any idea what some of your classmates were making as beginning salaries? I don't. I That's don't. probably wise. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned that you were doing domestic violence and um, family law mm -hmm. as some of your earlier cases. Do you mm -hmm. do any of them stand out for you? Oh, I mean, you know, we worked very hard with the women there to, um, because obviously our caseload was primarily with women um, from, it, with less financial Low income. Needs. Yes. Um, so, you know, we just worked to try and help them to be empowered to make decisions about what they did. You know, there were still cases, there were cases then as there are now of um, abduction of children. So, you know, we would work with the women trying to keep their children safe. You know, I remember uh, one situation with a woman from Alabama and her husband, you know, lived in East Nashville and we, we were trying to get evidence of his activities. So I remember, you know, sitting in East Nashville with Krispy Kremes and looking for him to come out the door with the children so that we could provide some evidence that, yes, he has the children. Oh, goodness. <laughs> He's taken them. Um, how long were you with Legal Services? Three years. Mm -hmm. And how did you make a transition from Legal Services to the next opportunity? So. Um, I became aware of an opportunity with the State Attorney General's office, um, Joe Haynes. Who uh, was at that time an, an uh, assistant? Was he a deputy? Deputy Attorney General. Mm -hmm. He was in my class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. And what did Joe say? Well, Joe wanted to, he of course made us aware of the, of the opportunity and just encouraged me to apply. And, uh, and I did. And I was successful in getting a position there. And what was the position? I was with their civil division. And um, then the civil division was mostly civil litigation. And so it was a lot of work 
um, and civil rights in the civil rights area, employment issues related to the state, all over the state. And as you worked there, did you have anyone who kind of took you under their wing and mentored you or showed you the ropes? So Joe was there, <laughs> thank goodness, um, and helped. But you know, General, and who was the attorney general at that time? General Leach. General Leach was very Bill supportive. Leach. Bill Hubbard, who was the deputy then, um, was was there and very supportive. Um, it was you know an another collegial environment. You know. And how long were you at the AG's office? About three years. It seems like I was on a cycle. <laughs> <laughs> three years. Um, do any of the cases that you have? At, had at the AG's office stand out for you at that time during well, those three years? Well, a few. Um, one was a housing discrimination case that we had down in Memphis. And um, there was, I mean, it was a significant housing issue and the state was involved. And um, we had to go into federal court to request an injunction. So dealing with the federal judges there, some of whom were more receptive to African American lawyers than others. So did you have an experience with one that was not receptive? It was yes. It was it was a very interesting experience when you would stand and argue before the court um, to to be dismissed, basically, um, and dismissed to the point of having the chair turn the back of the chair turn to you or um, displaying their sock feet on the bench, you know, those kinds of things. That is not typical uh, behavior for most judges. That was my experience, that that was not typical. And how did you deal with it at that point? I paused. Did it affect the person at all? Yes, they turned their back. They turned their back again? <laughs> yes, they turned their back to me. So, you know, then you just keep going. Hmm. We're lawyers. Right. You are supposed to maintain your professional dignity, yes. 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 Um, so what was the other case? You had the housing case, and what was the other um, one? The other one that, you know, that I remember was um, a, a tenured case, an employment case. And I remember it because um, we argued it before Judge Wiseman. And you know, it was the, one of the few times that you actually get to take a, court, a case close to trial because you know it's usually motion work but as a result of representing the board of regents there at that time i think it was a significant case in terms of my next job and that was what with after your general, three years general counsel with the state board of, of regents and what led you to make that move again another opportunity there was an, an opening there. I had worked with the Board of Regents, obviously, on, on this case, so I had some familiarity with the leadership there. Um, so while I didn't think at the time that I met all the qualifications, I was encouraged to just pursue it and see what happened. And so, that was Joe again? Joe, yes. He really did mentor you. He did. And he did. once you became general counsel for the Board of Regents, what was your experience as far as the caseload, what you did, and what was involved? So, you know, oh, and I might ask this. What were you making when you were at the Board of Regents as general oh, counsel? I think... You went from $12,000 to what? Oh, I know. I think at that point we went up to about 30000 Okay. Yes. Yep. Progressive. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's go back to the question about uh, what... what was entailed in being counsel to the so, um, Board of Regents. So, as and for those that don't know, tell those listening what is the Board of Regents. So the State Board of Regents is the governing body for all of the state universities, colleges, community community colleges, and area schools except UT. That's the way I always explained it. You get to the end and say, except UT, because they, it was a dual system. It was? Yes. Okay, so. So from you know, one end of the state to the other, we were responsible for governance. And you know, all of the legal 
educational issues, that was our responsibility. Can you give an idea of what some of those issues might have been? Oh, we had uh, perhaps the most significant was the uh, discrimination lawsuit that was ultimately settled while I was there, the Geyer lawsuit. Um, And Rita Geyer was suing why? uh, She was suing because um, she was not I guess it was because she was not able to get a position at TSU, and you had the distinct, you had these two distinct systems, UT and and the Board of Regents, TSU at that time, and um, there was um, some dissension over whether or not um, TSU could expand in Nashville, or if UT would control their part of Nashville, and TSU would remain only for the black students. So just to kind of set it in perspective and to spell it out, UT had a branch in in downtown Nashville Mm -hmm. close to Charlotte Mm -hmm. and the Capitol. Where the Avon Williams campus is now. Correct. And UT had its independent campus located more in North Nashville. TSU. Mm -hmm. Oh, excuse me, Mm -hmm. TSU. In North Nashville. And TSU was predominantly... Black, black, historically black. Historically black, and the University of Tennessee campus was almost totally white. Mm-hmm. And so... It's a segregated school system. Right, and that's really what mm-hmm. Geyer was trying to address in her lawsuit. Mm-hmm. Now, that lawsuit went on quite a while, didn't it? Did. it? We'll talk a little more about mm-hmm. that in a minute. But that was one of the types of litigation that you were involved in as counsel to the Board of Regents. What other types of cases did you have? So we didn't really do cases, remember. The Attorney General represents... That's right. Sorry. It handles all of the litigation. So what we we as the Board of Regents internal staff did, we handled the legal issues for all of the the universities. We handled like uh, tenure appeals. Contract disputes. Contract disputes. We would. One of the things that that we did is we did a lot of contracting. So we had to help the universities to um, put together contracts in a way that was um, that was more that was less that was really more concise. So that everybody was doing the same thing. So we developed contracting guidelines that were used across the state. You know, so we were more about the efficiency and administration of the school. Tell me your involvement in the Geyer case and mm-hmm. what uh, steps were taken either to litigate it or to settle it. So again, Attorney General's representing from a litigation perspective. Uh, I'm internal counsel, so I'm general counsel just supportive in that role. Um, my friend Richard Dinkins were, and I were then on opposite sides because he was he and Avon were representing Rita Geyer. So all of this was going on uh, at the same time. It was ultimately settled. You know, I feel like we, uh, the Board of Regents, was providing information to assist with the settlement and working on uh, aspects of it that we could implement. And ultimately, after the settlement was made with uh, Judge Wiseman, um, we were responsible for implementing the uh, settlement, and I had that responsibility of coordinating the implementation of the settlement statewide. Statewide? So you traveled quite a bit. Yes. And what did that do as far as your experience and introduction to the state as far as being out there statewide. Well, you know, just um, you know, just realizing first of all how vast and different the state is. Um, but it, it was, uh, I joke that it gave me a a sense of comfort because at the time, while occasionally we'd have the opportunity to fly in the state plane, mostly it was driving, getting up at five o'clock in the morning to get to um, the east or the west. And so you come to realize that the state is a mass network. Of, of resources, and it just gives you a level of comfort knowing that there's state um, folks that you can rely on whenever there's an issue. And what did you find out about your client? Those various places that you went, mm-hmm. you were now trying to implement policies mm-hmm. and to establish the policies. Mm-hmm. 
What was the reception like when you would arrive on a campus? Well, you know, the implementation, remember, the, well, you won't remember because you don't know, but the State Board of Regents is a centralized operation, or was. I think it has been totally Fractured. changed yes. now. Uh, but it was a centralized system, so uh, we had academics, we had facilities, we had different aspects at the Nashville office. And so working with each of those entities, we were coordinating the implementation and developing plans. So it was really the academic side of the house that would go out and work on the Grow Your Own program where we were trying to identify um, individuals who we could cultivate for positions, diverse positions across and the did, state. And did you see some results as far as what you were trying to achieve? through that? I'm probably not there long enough to really <laughs> observe all of the results, but you know, one of the, the, the wonderful things about that settlement is that you know, it afforded uh, TSU the opportunity to have access to financial resources to really improve uh, the campus. So mm -hmm. you know, if, if you went to the campus in um, the early 80s and then you went back in the late 80s or 90s, significant difference in terms of what that school looked like. And it improving. looked more like a Board of Regents school because the resources were made available for them to um, have the facilities that were appropriate. An upgrade. Mm -hmm. um, and now you mentioned you weren't there really after the settlement, really that long to see mm -hmm. all of the repercussions. Mm -hmm. You can see them from a distance, mm -hmm. but you weren't at, why did you leave? Another opportunity, <laughs> another opportunity presented itself. Um, the city of Nashville was, had a new mayor and um, Bill Boner wanted to um, have a legal counsel, and I was invited to apply. Now, who invited you to apply? I think Aubrey Harwell was probably the mastermind <laughs> behind that. Um, and there were a number of applicants, but um, I think because of my work at the state and with um, the Board of Regents, I was able to uh, make a case that I could also manage the legal department for the city. And. What, what was your responsibility as the Metro Legal Director? So Metro was, Metro as it was organized then, and I think they still maintain this, um, the council, the 40 member council has their legal council, and then you have the Metro Legal Director that's responsible for all legal matters other than the Metro Council. So, you know, our responsibilities were, were vast, representing all the departments, of course, which included uh, MDHA, so there was a lot of um, housing and development issues, um, building uh, the revenue board, we did bond work, we did, you know, a little bit of of everything. I think uh, when we spoke earlier, you were talking about what you learned about stormwater, yes. uh, the Public Records Act, mm -hmm. the Sunshine Law, that there were mm -hmm. constitutional issues that came up. Mm -hmm. um, do you recall some of your colleagues while you were there, some of the people that reported to you? Oh, my. So, yes, uh, Jim Charles uh, was my deputy. I think Jim is still there. Uh, Mike Safley. I think he's still there. Um, yes. Jim Murphy, who I think is now at Bolt. Um, Bob Murphy. Bob? Jim. Jim Murphy. Jim. You're right. Mm -hmm. Jim. Uh, Kanitha Sawyers, who was with, um, she handled the police department. So, and yeah, it was just, it was a, a great group of folks. Now, your selection as Metro Legal Director was a first in mm -hmm. two ways being the first woman and the first African American. Did that seem to have any impact on the staff or with the people that you worked with? I think it was a unique experience for some of the men to uh, have a woman uh, and not know somebody they didn't know. I was new to the department and you know a number of them had been there for years so they were 
familiar with what was going on. So I was a new face, so that was that was challenging. Um, and I think it was challenging for uh, the council as well to have a woman there. It was um, because they had relationships within de the department already also. And so I was a newbie. And <clears throat> I, I missed one little thing, and that was Roland. At some point, you and Roland <laughs> actually met. Yes. And do you recall how you met? So I was at the Board of Regents. Yes, I was at the Board of Regents at the time when we met, and we met at a, at a, legisl a black legislative caucus event. Um, I was doing some seminar, and he was there as a part of his business, and so we met then. And when, when did you next see each other, or how did that happen? Uh, probably when we were both in Leadership Nashville together. Which is a leadership training program. Yes, and we were in the same class for Leadership Nashville. What year did you all get married? 1987. And his background is as a business person. Mm -hmm. um, what was the experience with Metro Legal? You've said you did such a variety of things and you had responsibility for a lot of those. Mm -hmm. What were the things that appealed to you most? You know, I, I really enjoyed the development aspect um, of it. I enjoyed the securities work, um, the bond work. Um, what was it about that type of law that interested you? I think it was just that it was something that was different. I mean, we were, at the time, I remember dealing with air rights <laughs> over um, property on Church Street and just, you know, addressing things that I had never been exposed to before. And I had the opportunity to work with some very talented outside counsel that, you know, also, you know, supported what I was doing. The whole public works piece with um, stormwater and things of that nature. It was just, you know, the city is an amazing place to work. It really is for a lawyer. Learned a lot about public financing. Mm -hmm. I think you even said that there was the tax increment financing, yes. which is a yes. interesting way to finance some public right. uh, buildings. Right. So how long did you stay at Metro Legal? It was a political appointment, so I was there for four years. And what did you do when that ended, that appointment ended? So when that appointment ended, um, I was unemployed and um, thought that maybe it was time to take a break <laughs> from the practice of law and thought maybe I'd take a little time off to, um, to write because I had um, co-authored uh, an article that was published on public-private partnerships. And so I thought maybe I'll do some writing and just kind of take a deep breath because it was a very stressful four years. Um, and so I, at the time, uh, my husband had some office space, and I had just, I had a phone, I think. <laughs> and, um, and people started calling. And I had, I, I was starting to learn how to work with the computer, right? And so um, people were calling and saying, well, can you do this, can you do that? And I had my computer, and it occurred to me that with a business card, I'd have a law practice. And you did. And I did. <laughs> and what, what types of uh, issues or matters did these phone calls want you to handle? I ended up doing a lot of work initially on the healthcare side, representing professionals. Um, I also got involved with the Resolution Trust Corporation, so I was doing a lot of real estate. This is about 1991, 90? Yes. Okay. Yes. And so the, the work with the Resolution Trust Corporation... Um, Came about because what happened? Because the banks. Yeah. The little issue with banks and how they were financing and... It just, um, the government, I don't know how I would explain it, Carol, in terms of... It's difficult to put it all into, yes. like, one or two sentences, yes, but it, it was the Resolution it Trust the bank, Corporation. The, it was the failure of the banks, and, and people um, were not able to support the properties that they had built, the, loan, the lending practices um, 
were. So there were a lot of foreclosures. There were lots of foreclosures because the the lenders, kind of <coughs> like it was, I guess, a few years ago, that you know people were making loans that really weren't supported appropriately. With collateral. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when you worked with the RTC, um, what did that entail as far as what you were doing? Mm -hmm. Well, largely foreclosures. So um, we foreclosed on property all across the state. Um, really, I, I think about it at the time, we were foreclosing on property that is now Cool Springs. Um, yes, and you know, it was, it was very sad, you know, because you know, people really wanted to hold on to their property, but they didn't have the resources to do that. And once again, you're traveling around the state and you're going to these foreclosures. Mm -hmm. That must have been an interesting experience. Well, after the Attorney General's office, it was um, not as much of a challenge as you might think. You've been there. So, so yes, yeah, so yes, you travel to East Tennessee and you, you know, figure out where the courthouse was and go to the courthouse steps and, and you would foreclose on the property. So, um, what? You, you said they also were starting to get involved with health care issues or mm -hmm. something in that. So a number of my clients were physicians, and so I was helping to form physician practices and uh, just support physicians in general with whatever legal issues that they had, and um, started to um, represent a health care company at the time um, that had 350 Medicaid lives. and one of the vendors for that company had asked for some assistance. And so I was representing them and became very involved in that work and the challenges that they were having. What were some of those challenges? Well, um, they were, it was an African-American owned business that was doing business with the state and had a significant membership. 350,000 attributed lives is a large health plan yes, it is. Um, with a lot of revenue. So they had challenges in terms of the perception of their ability to operate. And during the time that you were representing them, what was the work that you did? Did you negotiate with the state? Did you negotiate with insurance companies? What were you doing at that point? So my role, I worked for what was the management company for um, what we created a management company that would help to support the HMO that was Correct. in place. Um, so, yes, my world, my role was to help to support and maintain the organization. Okay. Then, <clears throat> how did that lead to the development of your law firm or your practice? What What did you do next? So. Um, my law firm continued, I mean, we were doing commercial transactions, so we were representing banks and um, doing securities work and the real estate work, so we were, we were very busy. But then as the uh, work on the healthcare side developed, I was asked to go and form a law department for the healthcare company, for the management company. And how long did you do that job? I did that one for about seven years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what did you find to be the major challenges in that position? Uh, you know, probably, you know, working day to day with the state and trying to, to um, maneuver some of the perceptions about the capacity of the company to to operate. We had issues with technology. We, I mean, it was just, you know, a handful. But it was also a very exciting opportunity because the company was interested in expanding. So, you know, we were looking at opportunities in Texas and all across the South and in Africa. So I spent a little time in Africa as we were looking to um, create opportunities for physicians there and you know, just studying their healthcare system. And during the time that you're working in your law firm and when you transition to being corporate counsel, mm -hmm. 
Did you participate in bar activities? Were you still involved with the Napier Luby or the Nashville Bar Association? I was involved in Napier Luby, um, and I, I can't recall the exact dates, but I, I know that I was involved with the Nashville Bar Association um, and helped to facilitate their corporate counsel program, trying to assist African-American lawyers who were interested in working for majority firms to uh, be supported by corporations as they pursued those opportunities to build that client connection. Did you have any other uh, boards or committees that you served on in outside? In the MBA? Yeah. Or just? MBA or any or other? not-for-profit. Yeah, not-for-profits. Yeah, I, I did a lot of work <laughs> in the community. Um, I was involved in Junior Achievement. I was involved in United Way. I was involved in the Nashville Ballet that I continue to be involved with. Um, now, you're the incoming president of the Nashville Ballet? I am. When does that yes. take effect? This um, 2022. Pretty soon? So, yes, pretty soon. Okay. Um, so in addition to all of the responsibilities you have in the office, mm -hmm. and at this point in your career, you are uh, the counsel for this healthcare management company. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How long did you stay there, did you say? About seven years. And mm -hmm. what led you to leave them? So uh, the state uh, decided that they that the company was insolvent. Oh. Yes. As I said, there were some technology issues with the system that was purchased, and so the claims payments were not being made as timely as they should. It's not uncommon to have that occur. It is uncommon, I think, to have um, an entity that was solvent declared insolvent by the state and take it into bankruptcy. And what year would this have been about? This would have been um, about 2000. Okay, so <clears throat> they're faced with taking the company into insolvency, mm -hmm. and what was your next step? So, um, you know, I turned off the lights. You left so, the building. <laughs> yes. You know, I stayed and um, worked through the liquidation of all of the assets and uh, worked with the bankruptcy trustee. And, you know, I don't know how they ultimately resolved it, but, you know, my, my read of it is that they probably found that there was no insolvency, but everybody got paid as best I, I know. So, but they took the company out. And so, um, and then I was, again, unemployed. <laughs> and at that time, what did you do? Um, took a little time <laughs> to, um, refresh, uh, but uh, then just explored opportunities, um, other opportunities where I could use the experience that I had developed, and HCA um, had an opening that uh, I pursued, and ultimately I went to work for HCA. And what was that position that you entered into? It was um, an, a position with their, what's called their oper operations section. So I went initially, I was going to do work for their uh, group purchasing organization and that involved, you know, reviewing technology contracts, things of that nature. And at that time, what was your plan as far as longevity with HCA? Well, I didn't know where that was going to go, thought that I might be there a couple of years until, you know, something else came along. I think I'm nearing my 20th anniversary there now, so it's worked out very well. <laughs> you, you did tell me about uh, how that has transpired and how did you go from, say, group purchasing and the organizational part, mm -hmm. how, how has your career at HCA developed? So, um, went from the group purchasing operation where it was a lot of doing the same thing. You know, we, we were, I had you know, learned a lot about Verizon contracts and, you know, J&J &J contracts and all of those things that are related to healthcare. So it was, it was a wonderful experience. But then there was an opportunity to move into managed care, which is where I am now. So, and in that position, I'm working largely on payer relationships 
um, and that has evolved um, to not just the the sickness and etnos of the world, but being more uh, engaged with what we call value-based care. I, I want to ask you about that, but before I do that, explain to anyone listening what managed care in the HCA complex means. So, so managed care is the contract between the provider, and in this case, HCA, that is a hospital company largely, right. but we also employ physicians and have surgery centers and urgent care centers. So it is the relationship between those providers and the actual insurers, the Aetna's, the center, the Cigna's, the Blue Cross, the Humana's. Okay. And we assist the business in team negotiating in negotiating those contracts. Those contracts. Are those contracts generally for a term of years? It varies. Okay. Mm -hmm. Some are just for a year and then some are for? Yeah, depending upon the financial relationship. Uh, with regards to HCA, you were going to talk about the value. Value base. Uh, value base. But before I get there, what was your experience in observing how HCA itself is structured? You were talking about silos. Oh. Well, you know, it's a huge, huge organization, and um, our the company in general is structured to operate um, so that you are taking care of hospital issues, you're taking care of labor issues, and our legal department is much the same way. So there's um, there has been um, a prevalence of operating within these these segments. So managed care, for instance, is rarely engaged with employment issues. Or IT. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or labor, as you mm -hmm. say. Mm -hmm. So you have the silo mm -hmm. structure, managed maybe not care. intentionally, but mm -hmm. kind of evolved. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and then over this period of time where you were working in the managed care position, there's been a segue. Your position has changed to what you said is value-based contracts. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been working on those? I've probably been in this space exclusively probably for the past three, three or four years, mm -hmm. um, but started kind of easing into that before that and what we describe as pay-for-performance arrangements with payers. And so now my, my work involves um, helping to set up these legal entities across the company. And um, how, how does that differ from what was being done before in the contract relationship with the providers and the carriers, I guess? Mm -hmm. um, how, what is value-based contracting? Yeah, so value-based contracting is um, it really supports the movement from fee for service, fee for volume, to fee for value. So the payers are really uh, the payers, and I think really the government is really pushing um, for compensation reimbursement based upon the value of the service that's provided, and not just on the volume. Of the service so it's that's not provided. as many patients that you see, but what you are providing to that patient. Well. It's still based upon volume, but it's also based upon the value that you're providing those patients. So it's more about care coordination and care management and less about just seeing 10 patients, but it's the value that you bring to their care. And how many of these do you think that you've participated in over the last three, four years? Um, I've probably been involved in setting up about 16 of them. Now, HCA is probably in the vanguard of setting these up as regards... You know, I don't have a sense of what the other systems You've are been doing, so quite busy. frankly. Yes, I, I really don't know. Okay. Um, one of the things that I, I did ask is your involvement in other bar matters, the INSA court, I think, you have participated in? Yeah, I participated in the INSA court. I participated in the bar foundation. Um, 
Have you done speaking at any of the seminars? Mm, maybe one or two, not very much. And <clears throat> who would you say in the bar has influenced you? You mentioned Bob Lillard. Mm -hmm. Who else? And Joe Haynes. Uh, who else would yeah. you say has been an influence in your career? In the bar. Mm -hmm. I think Aubrey. I would, I would include Aubrey in that group. Um, hard, to, hard for me to, to name a few. I mean, Richard obviously has been an influence, a colleague and a friend in that respect. Um, hard for me to put my finger on the other folks. Um, has the State Bar, the Tennessee Bar Association, played a role in your career development? I have not been as engaged with the Tennessee Bar. No. Just the Nashville Bar mm -hmm. and Napier Luby. Mm -hmm. um, have there been any other organizations that have played a role in your development in the community or otherwise? Um, I mean, each of the community organizations I've been involved with, you know, have, there's an aspect of that involvement that has really helped me to understand another part of the community. So, And one of those right now is the ballet. The ballet, the Nashville Ballet. And how did you get interested in the Nashville Ballet? So um, I, I think I first became involved with the Nashville Ballet through the YWCA. Um, I think we had um, some board members there that were involved with the ballet, and I was interested in that. I always enjoy dance. and. Participate in ballet as a as a child, um, and just really appreciate the importance of dance in the development of your confidence um, as a young woman. So it was an opportunity for me to get involved and continue my interest in promoting girls. A nice transition. Uh, at some point, you were actually going to court. And you mentioned a few of your recollections of judges. Mm -hmm. Do you have any other um, recollections of your experience in the court that stands out, whether it was Tom Wiseman or somebody else? Mm -hmm. I would think, based on what you've said, that once you became counsel to a corporation, you don't go to court much no, more. I don't. I don't. Do so, do you have court. any? Recollections of judges that might have been positive or, as you said, negative influences on you? Well, you know, I, I had the good fortune of working with a, a number of judges over the years because I was with Metro Legal, so I interacted with judges there. Mm -hmm. uh, with Legal Services, I interacted with judges there at the time they had what Did was you the go family to the Supreme court. court. And I went to the, from the Attorney General's office, I was, I argued before the U.S. Supreme Court, so. And what was that like? Yes, well that was, that was an experience, you know, a wonderful experience. Um, what uh, case was it? Pickett versus Brown, I believe was the name of it. Um, and it was a, again, it was a, a child, it was related to child parental rights. And it went from the Tennessee Supreme Court to the Supreme Court, and that's how I had that opportunity. But um, General Leach and, and Bill Hubbard afforded me the opportunity to go in and, and argue before the court. I think they knew that it wasn't a winning case. <laughs> but the experience was wonderful, you know, to actually train and prepare and, you know, it must be have been there in the very chamber. Intense. Yes, it was, a, it was a wonderful, wonderful experience, but yes, very intimidating. And you might have been one of the first African-American lawyers to appear before them at the time. I never thought of that. Well, how many were there <laughs> <laughs> that went to the U.S. Well, Supreme that's, Court? Well, that's true. That's true. It's worth a little research. <laughs> <laughs> um, with regards to politics, mm -hmm. have you been active in politics during your legal career? I really have not been actively involved in politics. Um, you followed because, your father. <laughs> well, the, when you work in public service, you realize that that is not the place where you need to be. You, you, know, you need to stay neutral. 
What would you say has been the impact of your career on your personal life and your social activities? Hmm. So, you know, being a lawyer, I think you, it affords you an opportunity to observe things in a different way, to um, perhaps not be as judgmental and recognize that there are many sides to um, a position <laughs> or subject. And so you, as they say, you hold your powder and, you know, allow things to evolve. And just for me, I try not to, to have strong opinions that I, you know, proffer to, to groups about what is or is not right or wrong. And I've just come to realize that it's right or wrong is just something that um, is unique to your perspective. What would you say have been some of the rewards and advantages of being a lawyer or having a legal career? I, I guess the, the greatest reward is just having the opportunity to, to be a part of the system and to understand how it works and to understand really how important the law is to society in general. You know, you observe a lot of what is going on and it's, from a legal perspective, it's a bit scary because the structure is there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And if the structure fails, I don't know what, what we will rely upon. Then you have chaos. Yes. If you don't have a structure. structure. Um, but is practicing law something that you have enjoyed or liked? I have enjoyed it. I have enjoyed it. It's, um, as I said, I've had the opportunity to do so many different things that I've, I'm rarely bored, uh, always challenged, and yes, it's, it's been a great experience for me. What would you say have been some of the hardships or pitfalls of practicing law and your, your uh, career path? I don't know that there have been many pitfalls. I think that, you know, when you work in public service, you recognize that um, whatever you perceive to be those First Amendment rights and, and the opportunity to speak your opinion, that you really don't have that when you work uh, in the public sector. And perhaps you don't have that even in the private sector because there's always uh, consequences to expressing those opinions publicly. Um, I, th I think one of the things that I liked when we were talking earlier is that you said you framed some of these hardships and pitfalls as opportunities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that you just move on when you've encountered them. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you run into a, a, a person who says, we're not ready for you, mm -hmm. uh, how do you deal with something like that? Well, you, you really put that in perspective. I mean, you recognize that I don't assume that people are being mean-spirited. I believe that they're really speaking their truth. And so you, you recognize it for what it is. And probably from his perspective, they weren't ready. And it could have very well have been true, but it was an opportunity for me to to move along and to do other things, not dwelling in the past. I try not to, to dwell on, you know, things that could have been or might have happened and just keep moving. We have a vice president who is a woman mm -hmm. and she is African American and she's also, um, I think, She's a lawyer. She's a lawyer. That's yeah. very true. She's also a member of a very active women's group. Mm -hmm. And have you maintained any type of uh, association with any women's groups similar to that? Yes. Um, I'm very much involved in our local Lynx chapter, Hendersonville area chapter of the Lynx, um, where we're about providing service to the community. I've been involved with them for it's predominantly African American. Yes, yes. Okay. So and those are women, and is it aimed at families or children or? 
It's really about service. service. So a lot of my work has been aimed at um, families and children. I chair strategic planning, and I also chair the development committee, so I do a lot of fundraising for them. And do you enjoy that? I have. <laughs> um, that seems to be quite a contribution in addition to what you're doing uh, through your career. Let me ask you, are there any other current activities that you're participating in? Are you serving in any appointed positions? I serve on the Tennessee Codes Commission. Um, That's a very yes, important. Yes, it is. And I've been there for several years. Judge Birch, um, who is also has also been a great mentor, was also a great mentor, um, recommended me for that appointment. And so I've been there for several years just it's fortunately it's it's not a, a a responsibility that demands a lot of time, but it is important work. It is important work. Mm -hmm. Are there any other um, appointed boards or commissions that you serve? I on? serve on the uh, Metro Charter Revision That's Commission. Very, that is important. So yes. Uh, what projects are there yet to be accomplished for you? I feel like I've, just, especially this year, I feel like there's been a lot uh, that has been done. I think that mostly we want to perpetuate and grow some of the things that we've started. Um, we, our chapter was able to um, provide food baskets for 45 families for Thanksgiving. And so, you know, one of the things we want to do is to grow that so that we can, you know, be of more service to the community. One of the um, aspects of what you're doing is working for a company, as you said, for almost 20 years. Mm -hmm. uh, how much longer is that going to continue? Mm -hmm. Not sure. All right. But, <laughs> but um, well, what yeah. would be your projects after that? Exactly. That's the question. <laughs> what would I do? <laughs> <laughs> Because Maybe start a new business, I don't know. <laughs> are there things that you would like to do? You know, I'd, I'd love to be able to paint more. I'd love to be able to get back to travel and travel more. You know, do you travel even now? I mean, I, not with COVID, right, but... Right, not with COVID. But, yes, but have we, you traveled we've some? Had, we've, I've, been, I've had the opportunity to travel all around the world. So, oh, that's fabulous. Yes. So um, spent some time in Asia, some time in Africa, you know, been to Australia. So there are places that I haven't been, however, that I'm hoping will be um, on the list soon. Get to Paris. Yes. Have you been? <laughs> and Hawaii. No, I've not been. Well, I think Rowan needs to step up. I keep telling him that. <laughs> <laughs> well, other than that, uh, retirement plan, what other types of parameters do you see for your retirement? I just staying busy, you know, just recognizing that it's really important to, to stay engaged. So um, to support organizations that I, that I care about and to, to continue to share my experiences and uh, insights. All right. What, uh, this is the final question, what advice would you give to someone who is maybe in your shoes and only 18 and thinking that they want to be a lawyer, what would you tell them? Yeah, I think that um, perhaps most important is that they evaluate why they want, why they think this is important and understand that, you know, the practice of law is really about serving in some capacity or another. And if that's your personality, then go for it. Just do what is good for you and not what somebody wants you to do. Just identify what's important to you and then pursue that. And if that's the practice of law, you know, fantastic, because there's so many opportunities for women um, and minorities in the practice of law, and it is evolving. So, Susan, yeah. thank you. That was very good. Thank well, you. Thank you.